Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Rick Harnish, the Executive Director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, we are a nonprofit advocacy organization uh, firmly supported by our members. And we believe in um, an integrated network where states and the feds do integrated plans that combine both high speed lines operating at faster than 150 um, and upgraded freight lines with much more frequent service to many more places than we have today. And working together, those both will create a transformation in the way we travel, which will then support transit and walkable communities um, in the process, make it easier for people to see each other more often, which builds stronger community ties. Uh, let us burn less fuel in the process um, and reduce the need for parking and other infrastructure that's very expensive. Uh, we've been very focused this year on how do we change the overall view at the federal level of high speed and inner city passenger rail. Very focused on the reauthorization of the FAST Act, which got bumped back to uh, September of 2021. So we've, we've got a lot of time to be impactful there. But we have some more immediate needs in that the um, market for travel has changed dramatically. Um, and it will most certainly grow again, but it will be very different than it was a year ago. Um, and it will be very important for railroads, whether it's Metro or MBTA or Metrolink in LA or Amtrak, to be very aggressive about finding ways to attract new passengers with new services um, in a very different way. So we're very, very disappointed and upset that Amtrak has decided to retreat from the market um, in our part of the world, in Chicago, uh, where they uh, have gutted the network here. Um, and instead of trying to find ways to change the service to attract a lot more people, they've just retrenched and made it harder for people to take trains. Um, we do have the ability to talk to Congress to help change that in the Stimulus Act, which who knows where that goes, or the next appropriation. And the next appropriation has to happen by December 11th. So stay tuned on how you can be involved in that. But also on the Northeast Corridor, it's a key asset for our country. It connects a critical part of our economy. It's the closest thing we have to high-speed rail. Um, and we really need to have Amtrak and the states and others working on how to attract a lot more people with that. Um, and I think it means a very different service off offerings. So I'm very glad um, to welcome Scott Spencer with Ameristar Rail uh, to talk about their proposals. And you know, the speaker should always turn off his cell phone. Uh, <laughs> uh, Uh, Scott Spencer with America, Ameristar Rail to talk about their proposals for ways to increase traffic on uh, the Amtrak's Northeast Corridor very rapidly um, with new service offerings and a new approach to the market. So thank you very much for joining us. Well, you're welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation, Rick. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to uh, members and, and guests of the High Speed Rail Alliance. and. We're really grateful for all that you and your group has done over the years because you continue to raise the profile and the top of mind awareness of how important rail is not only to the Midwest, but throughout the, uh, the country. And uh, our initiative obviously is very important for the Northeast quarter, but we think uh, there are elements of what we're doing that can be replicated uh, not only in the Midwest, but in other quarters around the country. So uh, the Northeast quarter is a tremendous proving ground. And we really believe um, that it has a much greater potential. So our approach was to take a look at the existing infrastructure and bring in the private sector to do what we do best in terms of innovation, 
and collaborate with what the government does best in terms of infrastructure. And that's what you're gonna see uh, rolled out here uh, today. So I'll just uh, share my um, screen here so that um, we can pull this up. All right, and can everybody, can you see that first slide now, Rick? Yes, yes we can, thank okay, you. Okay, good, I just wanna make sure uh, I've got this uh, shared correctly. So our approach with the Northeast Corridor is to provide uh, high-speed rail service for all. And to tell you what we have in mind, uh, we really have developed what we believe will be the most dramatic transformation of the Northeast Corridor since the uh, introduction of America's first high-speed trains, the Metroliners in 1969. And if you think about it and put it in perspective of the quarter, yes, there's been efforts to rebuild the quarter and uh, major improvements such as expanding electrification uh, in New England from New Haven to Boston. But operationally, there hasn't been much change since the Metroliners in, in 1969. So again, we're taking a look at what its potential is and bringing in um, some significant innovation. And as a private sector um, initiative, what we're proposing to do is operate Amtrak trains with innovation in four key areas. And, and what I discuss here today, you can really put into um, the areas I'm describing innovation in these four areas. And, and it really answers a key question that many of us who are passionate about the rail industry find when we talk to our families and friends or elected officials, they all seem to ask that classic question, isn't there, there's gotta be a better way to run a railroad. And so we all know that, but what we focused on is these four key areas because every way of improving a railroad's operation and passionate service profitably, we found is achieved in these four key areas of innovation. That's service, marketing, technology, and organization. So everything we've developed, we've driven in these four areas of innovation. And um, Ameristar Rail's plan is to expand Northeast Quarter's capacity and service to meet travel demand for the next 20 to 40 years. And this is very important for those who know of the 50 million plus population in the Northeast Quarter, um, we're not going to have room to build another I-95. We're not going to have more room to expand airports, let alone build new airports in the next 20 or 40, 40 years. So the only place that you can responsibly absorb and serve population growth and economic growth, as we all know, is by rail. And that's what we're focusing on right here. And we look to achieve this on the Northeast quarter through new service patterns that unlock the potential by eliminating terminal operations at New York and in Washington. And I'll show you that here a little bit later. Running all the service, as many of us know, that works very successfully throughout Europe and Asia on clock face memory schedules. And Ameristar Rail uh, is not looking for a free ride here. As a private sector entity, our business model is focusing on the cost above the rail. So therefore we pay user fees for the track, the station, the signals, the catenary and the dispatching. And uh, we often are getting the question, uh, oh, so you guys are private sector, um, you must be like Brightline or you must be like uh, Texas Central. Uh, we're not. Uh, we are much more nimble enterprise in that we don't own infrastructure. And that's important, uh, we believe, to make ourselves more competitive because our competition in the air and on the highways do not directly own and maintain the infrastructure. They only pay for what they use. So we find that our rail operation can be much more nimble. And our rail operation, even though it's a private sector entity, is still to the public going to be Amtrak trains. 
So the best analogy I can give you to this is what happens in the airline industry with United and the United Express or American or American Eagle, Eagle or uh, European Airlines. Lufthansa has CityLine even running line hall as a private sector operator. So we really would be like an affiliated carrier where we're taking the revenue risk, we're taking the financial responsibility of the fleet and maintaining the fleet, but the trains will still uh, be painted Amtrak trains, marketed as Amtrak trains, ticketed as Amtrak trains, but we do what the private sector does behind the scenes. Another misconception I wanna get out of the way right away is there's the perception that the private sector achieves this by cutting off uh, sub subperforming routes and just focusing on a core route to maximize profit and in some cases doing it without union labor, but that's not Ameristar Rail. As you can see in our map, we actually expand the reach of the Northeast Corridor or on a number of routes, not just the core route. And uh, we have the business model running with the same union uh, agreements uh, that Amtrak has right now. So uh, this will be achieved only through a very strong and successful partnership with union labor. So I just wanna put those uh, on the table right up front. But our approach here is innovative in that we are focused on off offering high speed rail for all. And that's important because if anybody knows the history of the Northeast quarter, um, it's high speed rail routes are rooted with the Metroliners and they couldn't offer high speed rail to all because it was an experiment and they didn't have enough in the procurement to buy more than the 61 cars that they did. And it certainly wasn't electrified to Boston. So it created this uh, two different fleet operation which exists today between a seller and regional. And unfortunately, that does not give true equitable access to high-speed rail in America because most families, senior citizens, students cannot afford to ride on a Acela train. Yet their tax dollars are paying for the infrastructure that make the 150 miles an hour and certainly and next year to be 160 miles an hour across New Jersey because of a federally funded project. Those taxpayers can't afford to ride high-speed rail. So our approach is to offer high-speed rail for all with a standardized fleet of tri-powered train sets, and they will be capable of up to 160 miles an hour in catenary, 125 miles an hour in diesel, and on third rail up to 100 miles an hour. And uh, this is technology that is well-proven uh, in many places in Europe and Asia and uh, we're going to bring, bring it to the United States in, in a very robust way. Uh, all these standardized trains will offer triple class service in an all compartment configuration of seating and coach business and first class. And in this way, it provides affordable, equal access to high-speed rail in America for the first time. And our service patterns, as you'll see, will expand Northeast quarter, access to Northeast quarter high-speed rail service to several new routes that involve 32 new stations. So this is really a game changer. And by the way, uh, I'll get into specifics later, maybe in the question and answer, but we don't need any major new infrastructure built to do what we're gonna talk about here today. There's some upgrading, but uh, physically all this network exists today that we're gonna use, utilize. So we're gonna offer on Amtrak new services in the Northeast and new routes. And here's a summary of them. Uh, that's um, related to the stick map you see right here. Uh, we'll have trains running hourly from Harrisburg via Center City, Philadelphia and Jenkintown uh, to New York City and Springfield. And then those trains, as you can see on the map and red will be extended every two hours to Boston and Maine. We'll have trains running every two hours from Richmond to Hoboken via Center City, Philadelphia, every two hours. And uh, this will clean up the confusion on the Northeast quarter because right now, if you're at intermediate markets such as Aberdeen, um, Newark, Delaware, it's hit or miss as to when the trains run. 
we're going to put all those intermediate markets, including new ones like Elkton and Chester, Pennsylvania, on this route. And it's every two hours. And this is very much a standard that's successful throughout Europe and Asia. And the other reason we're, we're running this service pattern, if anyone's familiar with the, the, the choke points of slots on the Northeast quarter, um, the trains coming from Richmond and Virginia points are the ones most likely to be late. And they miss the critical slots through the tunnel and the critical slots on Metro North, and it fouls everything up. Well, we contain this variable by running all the Virginia services in and out of Hoboken. So we bypass that crit those critical slot issues and we run it every two hours. The other game changer here is to run nonstops hourly, seven days a week. Again, anyone knows the history of, of the Northeast quarter, there's been various attempts at running nonstops, but they've never been more than a single or two round trips a day. We're gonna be very competitive by running nonstops hourly, like clockwork, seven days a week. Then the core services are from Alexandria, because Northern Virginia is a very lucrative market through New York City to uh, Boston, that's every hour. Plus, there'll be another train running hourly from Alexandria to New York City, but on to Long Island, to Ronkonkoma, a remarkable market that I'll get into in a little bit later. But when you combine this, because we're running a standardized fleet, we're offering a service frequency between New York and Washington that's never existed before every 30 minutes because every passenger, whether you're coach, business, or first class, will have a train every 30 minutes. And it's essentially doubling the service with the same number of trains moving that are moving right now where you have generally pre-COVID uh, an hourly Acela train, an hourly regional train, now, all those markets will have a train every 30 minutes. That's going to be a game changer in those markets. And then we have another service that's the Empire service um, from Albany, New York City. But that's going to be a game changer for the state of New York because those trains will run hourly onto Long Island to Ronkonkoma. So I mentioned about the nonstop uh, high-speed rail for all. So they'll run seven days a week. Again, they'll all have a triple class of coach, business, and first class, which is what you find in the airline industry, right? The airline runs all those classes on a jet. They don't put coach passengers on a separate fleet of propeller planes. They have them all running on jets. So we'll do that here as well. And the nonstop services that we'll offer, Boston to New York in just under three hours, top speed 150 and average is speed of 77.4 miles an hour. You can see Washington to DC, we'll be able to get it down to just under two hours. And that's with uh, the new Acela fleet that, uh, that tilts. That's how these two timings are uh, achieved, a top speed of 160 miles an hour starting next year. And then um, the Harrisburg trains are going to be running um, from New York on to uh, Springfield and then every two hours to Maine. But we're gonna run those trains nonstop between New York and New Haven to give us maximum flexibility on the Metro North segment because we're not stopping at intermediate platforms. We can run on any track in any direction, but it's gonna open up a very lucrative market. Um, oh, that's actually uh, the wrong, I have a, a typo there. It's uh, one hour, 29 minutes. It's 90 minutes between New York City and uh, New Haven, one hour, 29 minutes. And then uh, the combined nor, uh, nonstops will be running through. A uh, passenger could travel from Boston to DC in just under five hours. Other uh, quarter service improvements include a uh, throughway service that will connect Grand Central Terminal on a regular basis with the Penn Station in New York, Boston, North Station, and all those commuter travelers to Boston South Station, various airports, and then a very intriguing one is uh, Staten Island to uh, Metro Park. It's a large borough, but it takes as much as two to three hours to get onto an Amtrak train and, and sometimes the wrong way if you're going to Philadelphia or uh, Washington. So we'll have um, a 20 minute ride from uh, the Arthur Kill station on the, um, SRIT, uh, the SIRT on the Staten Island to Metro Park. Door-to-door uh, -door baggage service, bicycle spaces, uh, there'll be assured seating in uh, the compartments on these trains and food service on all trains, including the Harrisburg and Albany trains. 
And then we have a very intriguing system to provide on-time performance control. And there you see a photograph of uh, the station in Center City, Philadelphia, that the Harrisburg uh, Springfield main trains and the Richmond Hoboken trains will serve. Our team on Ameristar Rail includes uh, former Amtrak president, uh, Paul Reistrup, who's our senior advisor, J. William Vigris, who uh, was assistant general manager at PACO. He's our senior advisor, Neil Glassman, who is a chairman of a law firm in Delaware, is our chief strategy advisor, and myself. And most of my career, I, I was uh, responsible for developing the through service for SEPTA's uh, commuter rail tunnel and uh, developed a startup and operating plans for uh, Cairo Metro, Taiwan High Speed Rail. And I spent uh, some time with the Linwald line there with uh, Mr. Vigris. So a lot of the playbook from the through operations with SEPTA's commuter rail tunnel is what we use here today to develop this network uh, for our services. This map uh, highlights in yellow uh, the 32 new stations on the route, primarily uh, in the Amish country, uh, the old Reading route through Jenkintown, Langhorn, uh, the Long Island out to Ronkonkoma, the intermediate stops such as um, uh, Chester and Elkton, and then um, the services in Maine will have a direct one seat ride for the first time in 60 years to uh, New York and Philadelphia. And I'll show you how we achieve all this. So we developed through operations in New York, but Paul Reistrup uh, said, well, why don't we develop through operations in Washington? I'm said, well, how, let's take a look how we do that. And he uh, pushed for the plan for us to go all the way to Alexandria. And anyone knows these are very lucrative stops, in fact, Lofon Plaza in, in Washington, D.C. has twice as many passengers as Union Station on the VRE trains. So it's, it's like a back bay and then some uh, for Washington. Crystal City, of course, is uh, adjacent to uh, many defense contractor offices, the Pentagon, uh, Reagan National Airport, and the future uh, Amazon headquarters is right there. And then, of course, Alexandria. So this is a game changer because now Northern Virginia it hops on a train in eight minutes, the trains at Washington DC going nonstop to New York or to the other points in between. And how we do that? We'll take a look at this uh, track network. Um, they have a plan to expand and this is what it looks like, uh, the platforms at Washington Union Station, but we don't need any of those upper level tracks. We simply run through on those two tracks that will have high level platforms. And it's a game changer because anybody who's familiar with uh, this area here, K Tower, all these trains right now in Amtrak are like fish going upstream against the revenue trains just to get into Ivy City. We move everything out of Ivy City, we move everything out of uh, Washington Station, and uh, what we do is build a uh, servicing and, and layover facility uh, south or west of Alexandria. That's the game changer. Now, if you wanted to achieve the throughput capacity, the the, the amount of capacity we're gonna free in these upper level tracks, the amount of capacity we're gonna free up in Ivy City, you'd have to spend billions of dollars. That's why this is such a game changer for what we're doing, but we're opening up new markets. In Philadelphia, you can see the through operations right here with the Harrisburg trains going through Center City, Philadelphia on the old Reading Route, Wayne Junction, Jenkintown, Langhorn. And then we have in uh, the New York area, uh, we take a lot of slides to show you what we do here, but Essentially, we have trains going to Hoboken, uh, the Albany, and the hourly New, uh, uh, Alexandria, Washington, Philly trains going out here to uh, on the Long Island. Now, this won't happen until the mainline project is completed here because of the need to have the triple tracks. But once that's in place, the trains will be able to head out there. And it's a game changer. Anybody knows about Long Island? Yes, you could take the Long Island Railroad and change, but you know that's inconvenient. Uh, those seats aren't comfortable for the hour plus rides coming out here. Those who are driving, you have to go through Midtown Manhattan or over to Verrazano Bridge, two incredibly crazy choke points. Our trains will be halfway across New Jersey before you even get through these areas if you are driving Long Island. Same thing for people who are driving off of Long Island trying to go to upstate New York. So this is really a remarkable game changer, unlocks the potential in New York. Same thing what we do with Hoboken. Hoboken has excellent ferry access here and path access to lower Manhattan. It's directly next to Jersey City here in the Hudson Berg and light rail transit system. Jersey City is now the largest city in New Jersey. They've recently passed Newark uh, with that uh, distinction. 
and another borough. So I talked about how Staten Island has a circuitous route to get to um, uh, Amtrak. Same thing for Brooklyn. It's an hour to an hour and a half subway ride or, or, or Uber to get to Penn Station, New York. What we we're gonna have here is a 25 minute ferry ride from Hoboken to points in um, Brooklyn to open up that market. So let's see what we do at Penn Station, New York. This is what it looks like. This is how the tracks are being used now with the orange being New Jersey Transit. The um, Amtrak trains are sharing with New Jersey Transit on these blue platforms. Uh, New Jersey Transit, all uh, Amtrak and Long Island Railroad share these two gray platforms and that's all Long Island Railroad. What we do with our through operations, remember nothing will terminate, layover, or even use Sunnyside Yard. It's all a through operation. And so the way we achieve that is running through the center of the house with the Boston Washington trains. Because of the Empire Connection tunnels, we have to bring the Empire trains on these two tracks, but then they run through to Long Island. And so this inc creates in incredible economies of scale in terms of crew utilization, equipment utilization. We're changing the cost of the overhead costs at Penn Station, New York, and generating revenue elsewhere like Long Island and New England. And we do it with these dark green um, platform extensions, which I'll show you in this cross section. So here's the center of the house on tracks 11 and two. And here's one of the game changes we achieve with through operations. Penn Station is the busiest station on Amtrak in the country, yet it's the only station where you cannot pre-position passengers as we do all stations waiting for the train to arrive to get on because the platforms are so narrow. So how do we achieve this? We do not permanently take these tracks out of service. We take tracks 10, I'm sorry, yeah, 10 and 13, and we put the platform cars, which is commonly used in the Northeast quarter already for track work, and we put them there so that the boarding passengers going to Boston, the boarding passengers going towards Washington can be pre-positioned before the train even arrives. When the train arrives, the uh, passengers arriving in New York use the center platform to leave the train, and then we let the passengers who are already in position board the train. And guess what? Instead of a 15, 20 minute plus uh, layover in New York, two minutes. All the trains are in New York just uh, for two minutes. And then we are able to achieve running times for passengers going from like Philadelphia to Stanford or um, from Newark to New Haven or Boston. We're improving their running times 15 minutes or more. And think of what you'd have to spend in terms of uh, track improvements to be able to uh, achieve uh, that kind of running time improvement. It would be in uh, the billions of dollars to do that, but we do it simply with this through running operation. And also what it does for New Jersey Transit, they use these tracks too when we're not using them and they can offload their multi-level trains on both sides of the trains and board them as well, getting in and out of the house. So essentially, this creates, uh, again, both in Penn Station and Sunnyside Yard, this type of capacity would cost billions of dollars. What we do in Boston, this is the traditional uh, running of the corridor in and out of Boston South Station. But the trains from Harrisburg that run every two hours to Boston and Maine come over uh, a existing connecting track, um, the Grand Junction connector and uh, go into Boston North Station and they simply change ends like many trains do in New York, uh, in Europe and go on to uh, uh, Boston. And I wanted to point out one other track improvement that we have to deal with. This connection here exists, but we have to upgrade it. This is a connection from the old Reading to the Penzies uh, Trenton cutoff. And we would just do that. And uh, the same thing in Washington. Uh, Washington would be uh, improved with the plans that Virginia has uh, later this decade to uh, build the Long Bridge and so forth. So those are all things that we would uh, build on the uh, existing infrastructure for um, our services. So uh, that's a uh, overview. Let me just let you know what's happening next. Uh, we're looking to negotiate with Amtrak, but we just sent a letter uh, and we don't expect to negotiate Amtrak uh, uh, right away because they've got a lot of other issues, but we will and begin discussion with Amtrak here momentarily because of a letter we sent October 20, uh, October 15th, 
uh, Paul Reistra uh, sent this letter to uh, President Flynn of Amtrak. And it's about the urgency of removing the Amfleet the Northeast Corridor as soon as possible. And that's because there's a number of safety issues with these cars as they were built nearly 50 years ago. They don't have the structural materials, the technology, the crash energy management systems of even the existing cellars, let alone trains that are built in the 21st century. And we know from the tragic wreck of, of Amtrak 188 in 2015 in Philadelphia, they, the risk of these individual cars jackknifing or rolling over into immovable catenary poles that still exist uh, on the quarter. So all these say we really shouldn't be, there's a big difference between running a, a, a train from at 79 to 125 miles an hour. And so we think there are a number of safety issues with the aging fleet. So due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the regionals and the Acellas are now operating less than 40% load factors. So if you have trains more than half empty, why run them both? We want to remove the Amfleet, the ACS 64 trains now, operate all the services between Harrisburg and New York and Washington and Boston with the existing Acela fleet and phase in the, uh, the new Acela train sets. And we are going to arrange uh, private financing to modify both fleets with a real game changer in this uh, existing COVID pandemic as well as post pandemic environment. That is to go to all compartments with triple class seating and coach business in first class. Now, some might think, oh, we might not need that once the COVID situation is gone and the ridership we don't think is gonna rebound for three to five years, but we think the compartments will be a competitive answer for us with the privacy of, of, uh, of automobiles. So even after this COVID pandemic, we think the comfort of uh, those compartments uh, will be very attractive and very competitive for us. So with that, I would be happy to take uh, any questions that you might have. And also you see our website here, much of what I've discussed is on our website at ameristarrail.com. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, I got a number of questions in advance and Bill Porter was the first um, out of the box today with a question about, you know, um, there's tremendous work that's been done on needed uh, designing new tunnels in Baltimore, a new bridge over the, as it the Scully, uh, the river? The Susquehanna, uh, the Susquehanna bridge. Susquehanna mm -hmm. um, and the tunnels under the Hudson. Um, my, tell me about how this fits in with those proposals. Right, it fits in very well in, 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 in a couple of respects. Number one, uh, as a private sector entity, we're converting the chronic losses they have on the Northeast Corridor right now into uh, revenue. And that revenue in terms of our user fees for the infrastructure is hundreds of millions of dollars that they can plow back into the infrastructure, as well as the state supported agencies. You know, uh, PennDOT is putting in millions and millions in operating subsidies on their route, state of Maine. And we've all had discussions with them and said, look, we'll eliminate your operating losses because we can operate profitably with expansion of service, but channel that money back into the infrastructure. So we create new revenue streams for the infrastructure. And we also provide a better return uh, for the public sector's uh, investment in improving those tunnels and those uh, bridges because we're going to generate more ridership with our service pattern. You saw we're uh, providing Northeast quarter benefits to 32 new, new stations, including points on Long Island. And we're providing for the first time access to high-speed rail in America for all with the coach passengers. So those investments in those infrastructure will have a greater return for the public uh, with our initiative. Now I'm confused. I heard you say the deficits on the corridor, and yet I keep hearing that the corridor is profitable. Well, they are above the rail until COVID hit. Now Amtrak is facing several years of chronic losses. You know, from what we've evaluated here, not just on the corridor, but in the airline industry, uh, even with 
a, a vaccine for COVID-19. Even with this disease perhaps disappearing uh, quickly, uh, there have been so many fundamental changes within our cities and economies and the way we work that we don't believe will surpass 2019 ridership for another three to five years. And right now, Amtrak is losing hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in Northeast Quarter operations, which is why they're looking for supplemental uh, appropriations, which is why we're saying, remove the Amfleet service right away. It's a safety issue and it's a drain on taxpayers. Because why would you run two trains more than half empty? We can run profitably one train set uh, uh, profitably with all compartments and um, you eliminate your operating losses. So uh, that's really a, a very important uh, inflection point that we have an opportunity to do. Um, so the, I was a little snarky there, but the point being the trains generate an operated or used to generate an operating profit, but the operation overall was not. Um, and therefore we should figure out how to get as many people on that as possible um, uh, by running different service. Uh, so the MBTA has a, an 80 mile an hour speed limit uh, um, on their section of the route. Does that change? Is there a way to get that to change or which which uh, which route you which route are you speaking about the route that takes trains in the main? Uh, oh, I I said MBTA. I meant MTA. So, oh, MTA. Yeah. Um, they have a couple of stretches where the top speed between New Haven and um, <clears throat> New York, uh, uh, more specifically Shell interlocking, um, is 100 miles an hour. But most of it is uh, you know well below that. Uh, no, we're not able, you know, everything that we've uh, operated uh, and planned out with the fleet and the schedule patterns, um, they're um, uh, based on the existing uh, running times. Uh, but we achieve higher performance uh, of high speed by running trains nonstop through those segments, particularly the uh, Harrisburg Springfield uh, main trains. They'll, they'll create a nonstop service every hour between New York and New Haven by running nonstop in less than 90 minutes with the existing infrastructure speed. Uh, so right now, there are two, well, pre-COVID, there were a couple, there was a daily night train from Atlanta and a trice weekly night train from uh, Chicago operating on the corridor. Do you have a view on, on whether those should continue or look different or have a stronger connection at DC? Well, I think, uh, oh, I think all of us recognize the need to have uh, at least daily service on these long distance routes. Uh, there's a lot of economy to scale. There's a lot of competitive advantages. We all know that. Uh, but with our operating plan, we're focusing on trains that are originating and terminating uh, on points that are served in the Northeast Quarter. Uh, those Florida trains, the um, uh, Palmetto, the Carolinian from Charlotte, um, the uh, Cardinal, uh, the Pennsylvanian, uh, Amtrak would still run those as they see fit. Uh, but uh, our operating plan and our, by the way, you asked about the infrastructure. The other thing we're doing, we're, we're able to uh, take on the financing uh, you know, this COVID uh, depressed ridership, Amtrak doesn't even have the revenue to pay the loans on the new Acela fleet. So um, what we do is free up those tax dollars to go into uh, the infrastructure improvements. But Amtrak would still continue to run those long distance services as they see uh, fit on the quarter. Uh, what I'm showing you here is just the trains that we would... Uh, take financial responsibility to operate, which are originating and terminating on these routes. Uh, and then I, so there's a number of other owners, MTA we discussed and others. Um, uh, how does it work to, um, in the negotiations with this? So it seems like a pretty 
complex negotiation with Amtrak, DOT, and multiple track runners. How does that right. work? Right. Well, we, 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 we've uh, had courtesy call discussions with all the host railroads. Uh, they're, they're aware of what we want to do. But I can tell you uh, with the user fees, because we, we will pay user fees to Metro North to use their tracks to New Haven. We'll pay user fees to the Long Island Railroad to use their slots out to run Konkama. Same thing with New Jersey Transit and Hoboken. What's not to love? They all love that. That's new revenue streams that we're generating. Plus our services are so robust that we're generating uh, connecting ridership on their routes that are feeding adjacent Long Island Railroad stations and routes that are feeding into Hoboken for New Jersey Transit. So uh, this uh, initiative puts more money on the table with us and without us for all these entities. Um, if you look at the service pattern, we are maximizing capacity on the Northeast quarter with a very measured operation of slots. And I know this is entirely doable because I had to develop the startup and operating plan for the first through operation in North America with SEPTA's commuter rail tunnel. And intuitively, we had a lot of people say, you're gonna take 400 plus trains that are terminating on 13 tracks at um, Reading Terminal and eight tracks at Suburban Station and jam all these trains on just four tracks, not gonna work. But it does work. It is such an incredible efficiency. So we're bringing that efficiencies to the Northeast quarter, unlocking capacity. And I can tell you right now, the um, Long Island Railroad and New Jersey Transit love this game plan right here because we free up more capacity for them uh, with this than without it. Uh, in fact, the, the capacity here, we haven't run the numbers, but uh, because the Penn Station South proposal, which is multi billions of dollars here, is all stub tracks, this here has the potential of creating more capacity and save those billions of dollars in Penn Station South. So the, the, the railroads recognize what we're doing right here and unlocking the potential and uh, making their operations uh, more successful this way. And I know this isn't part of your proposal, but I've always wondered about NJT in Long Island. Wouldn't it be good if they could figure out how to do through running? Um, would that have a similar impact? Well, I think uh, we can certainly be an inspiration for that uh, because here we're taking the investment in existing facilities and by the through running, not only are you getting operating efficiencies of the crew, the equipment, you're unlocking the potential for new markets. So what we've done here it's taken all the dead time of New Jersey, of, of, of Amtrak trains laying over amongst New Jersey Transit and Long Island trains, not making money. And we've converted this layover and terminal time to revenue generating operations. So they certainly could achieve it. And I know it's possible because I did the same thing with the SEPTA and it was incredible the operating efficiencies that we achieved with the through running of the commuter rail tunnel. So this is existing facilities are already in place. And to your question, Rick, uh, the other thing we are doing, our uh, service patterns here represent a higher utilization of the federal investments in the Long Island Railroad, in Hoboken Terminal, in Metro North, because it allows us to expand service to taxpayers in very innovative ways. So these uh, commuter agencies are able to make a stronger case in Albany and in Washington because now their facilities have a greater role in interstate commerce. Um, so can you go back to the Penn Station issue and, and clarify what you're proposing there? Right. So in order to achieve all these through operations, we take this convoluted, uh, congested uh, assignment of tracks and NJ uh, Transit uh, trying to uh, jockey with Amtrak trains. Amtrak trains right now use this as a terminal to restock the Empire service trains and service and clean them before our next trip. Some other Amtrak trains turn in the house right here too. So that's all very congested, very inefficient as well as going back and forth, deadheading the sunny side in some cases. 
we change every movement. Every time you see an Amtrak train coming on these four tracks, they are generating revenue. No more deadhead moves. So that's revenue generating capacity, but it unlocks this 100 year old congested station without building anything by using these platform extension, uh, extensions on these flat cars with our through operation. Now, trains aren't even sitting in the house 15, 20 minutes uh, on a run between Boston and Washington. They're only there, every two, only there for two minutes. And that makes us get out of the way faster for New Jersey Transit to come in. And when they unload hundreds of passengers on a multi-level train, they can unload on both sides of the train now with these uh, platform extensions. So this is a, a really impressive uh, game changer that will make a dramatic improvement uh, the way uh, trains uh, operate through and into uh, Penn Station, New York. Without any capital projects, the only thing is building these uh, platform cars, which incidentally can be moved whenever there's wire work or track work on the other tracks. Uh, these tracks are not permanently out of service. They're just uh, used interim wise with these platform cars. Um, and then uh, just to quickly answer a question, so the, the, the way that you can through route on the Long Island is that you're proposing the trains would have third, third rail capability. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the tri-powered trains will be able to run on catenary, diesel generated power, and they have third rail shoe pickup. But I'll tell you, this is another game changer for the Northeast quarter. Uh, it's going to require uh, some modification of the existing uh, Alstom Macella fleet that's being built right now. But here in the 21st century, our tri powered trains will no longer have a uh, train dead in the water on the Northeast Quarter when catenary wires come down or the power fails. We know those things happen inevitably. We're going to be able to keep the trains moving, keep the lights on, the air conditioning, heating working, the food service working, and the restrooms working. We've all heard the horror stories of these trains being disabled because of some catenary issue. The trains are going to have greater resiliency, and that's what the passengers expect in terms of reliability. Uh, you know, going back pretty far, the compartments, tell me how you envision those being set up. Well, the compartments actually, we already had compartments in, in mind for first class, but we had to have some very uh, interesting discussions with the investment funds that are available to fund uh, our initiative. Uh, we had to sort of reassess everything when the ridership cratered to just 5% of what it was before. And I had to make sure, are you guys going to still be on board? And they said, well, you better come up with a fix fast because you know we're not going to be able to finance ridership that's only five percent either so i said all right we'll go back we'll figure this out and uh we figured it out we decided to go with all compartments to give passengers greater confidence in the middle of this uh pandemic uh, that they can travel safely and what's wonderful about that we actually uh, looked at the engineering uh, for the uh, HVAC air circulation system. And so each of the compartments are gonna have individual controls, just like our automobiles. You know, We just digitally set and forget the temperature and the fan flow and all that. So all the compartments are gonna have uh, those comfort factors that people are accustomed in their automobiles. But uh, we're gonna bring in, as we mentioned in our letter to Amtrak, uh, some very important innovations right away uh, with the existing Acela fleet, because we're gonna run this with the existing Acela fleet, uh, but we don't need all 20 train sets. So we'll have the ones we're not running going through the compartment retrofits. Um, but even before that, we're gonna bring in uh, ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet cleaning technology uh, to the cars. And we're gonna incorporate that into the compartment filtration systems so uh, passengers have a higher degree. And the other thing, Rick, that does right away, these compartments, for those who have to travel with masks, once you're in a compartment with family, travel without the mask. So it's a much more competitive situation than what people face in the open cabins of the air shuttles or uh, motor coaches. Um, so we're going to be very competitive in that respect uh, going forward. 
We also have a very in innovative uh, ticket pricing program that's going to make us more competitive in gaining market share in a, in a depressed market. So these are all things that we'll do to succeed in, in ways that Amtrak hasn't been yet able to do with their operating losses now in the Northeast quarter and the ridership that is cratered. So, but would it be like uh, four seats with two each facing each other? Right. And they're, they'll, they're, they're very much uh, what we found in Europe um, and uh, anyone who ran, who rode the, the original um, uh, until the high-speed trains took over the Trans Europe Express. So the compartments will be in configurations of two, four and six facing seatings. We'll have uh, tables that will actually lower out of the ceiling so that if you have a travel person, uh, travel companion who needs to use the restroom, table lifts up out of the way. Uh, be very accommodating uh, for everybody that way. Well, that sounds cool. Yeah. Um, you're generating lots of questions and I'm not doing a good <laughs> job keeping up. Did you do a, a, a simulation model of, this, of these operations? Well, we have uh, done a, a, a hard schedule of all these trains so that we understand how the slots fit with the existing capacity. So the slots work, the discipline of a clock face memory schedule creates uh, uh, better utilization of capacity. The other thing, it's a, a game changer in the operating plan that we've developed is because we're using a standardized fleet, all the trains are running at the synchronized speeds through the curves, acceleration, deceleration rates, top speed. It's a dispatcher's dream. We don't, we eliminate the need to schedule overtakes on the Northeast quarter. And that significantly improves uh, capacity. The other thing we do in this urgency of replacing the Amfleet as soon as possible, we have the brand new uh, ACS uh, 64 electric locomotives uh, we have some plans for those, and some of those would be cascaded uh, to Boston, to New Jersey Transit, maybe to some of the SEPTA and to Mark. There, there is nobody, nobody in the world running a quarter with two different types of train sets, two different types of speeds, which what Amtrak has been doing between regional and Acela. Nobody does that in the world. Uh, and nobody in the world that I know is wasting the efficiencies of electrified operations with all diesel operations. It makes no sense. So we're gonna create better capacity and corridor fluidity uh, with all the commuter trains running on um, uh, electric. Even the Stoughton trains uh, can run with an electric on one end and a diesel on another. So once they're on the electric seg segment, uh, they, uh, they, at Stoughton, they, uh, I mean, at, uh, on the corridor, they can run up uh, on under wire that way at Canton Junction. I have always been frustrated that there are so many diesels running on that corridor. Oh, that's gotta stop. That, that, is a, that is a capacity killer. It's incredibly inefficient and environmentally and all those reasons. So uh, we'll, we'll free up these locomotives with this uh, urgency to, uh, and by the way, the Amfleet removal is important. It, the airline industry has already done it. MD-80s, legacy aircraft and the Delta fleet, gone an American airline fleet gone. Just a few weeks ago, uh, British Airways, they had plans to use the legacy Boeing 747 jumbo jets for several more years, including, I think in 2024, 2025, they were gonna have a farewell retirement tour in, in the last uh, flights of service. They said, we can't do this, they're gone. So why is Amtrak running two different trains with all this excess capacity that taxpayers have to subsidize the losses on. And more importantly, these Amfleet uh, have safety issues at running at those uh, speeds well above 100 miles an hour. So we say immediately. In fact, uh, once we get a green with Amtrak, we'll be able to implement our plan to go to an all Acela fleet within 90 days. That's how urgent and capable it is to do this. The, the only other modification we have to do, there's some intermediate stations like Aberdeen, but we, uh, they have low level platforms, but we have a, a, a modular uh, platform capability to install in very, very short period of time. So they're all have a high level platform access. And then uh, to all the, the people who have asked questions, I'm, I'm glad that you asked so many 
And I'm sorry to you if, if we didn't get to yours, but I really appreciate that you've been so Well, Rick, I, I have a few more minutes. If, if anybody, if, if you want to stick around, it's up to you. Uh, be okay. happy to hang on if you'd like to do that. Well, um, one, one question we should clarify real quick is what, what kind of are, uh, let me get back to it. So who are you exactly? And I'm sorry to put it so bluntly, yeah. but, but what is your company and how is it related to Amtrak and the other firms? Right. Uh, Ameristar Rail is a Delaware LLC and uh, we're created as a railroad that would operate the service. Again, according to the uh, union labor agreements, railroad retirement and FRA requirements, but we would operate as an affiliated carrier uh, with Amtrak. So again, uh, these would still be Amtrak trains, but uh, initially we would contract the, the Amtrak crews and eventually hire them. Uh, but uh, we would run these as Amtrak trains, marketed as ticket as Amtrak trains. But Ameristar Rail takes on the full revenue risk of financing like the compartment modifications, um, and the financing of the future uh, tri-powered fleet. But we have a business model as a railroad only focusing on the cost above the rail, the crews, the equipment, the equipment maintenance, the equipment financing, insurance, uh, marketing, um, administration. And then we pay user fees to the government owned infrastructure, whether that be Amtrak, Metro North, Long Island Railroad. Uh, for the stations, tracks, dispatching, signal systems. It's what happens in the airline industry for these slots or user fees for highway and tolls and so forth. And then kind of building on that, what does it take to move this from a really cool idea to reality? What are the next steps? And is there anything we can do to help? Well, certainly we would appreciate the support of the High Speed Rail Alliance, your members, uh, others who might want to make uh, their elected officials aware of what we're doing. Amtrak is well aware of what we're proposing. Um, so in the near term, uh, our letter to Amtrak is going to be re re released Monday publicly. Uh, and that's really urgent because uh, both the taxpayer losses on the existing quarter operations and the safety issues of running Amplate, we, we've just got to remove those from, from high speed service. They're perfectly safe for routes in the Midwest under 79 miles an hour, but not at speeds well over 100 miles an hour where you have immovable catenary poles. So we'd like to get support on that initiative. And, um, but, uh, <clears throat> The way we're going to pursue, uh, proceed with this is to work through the USDOT because they own 100% of the controlling stock of Amtrak. And essentially, they can recognize how good of a deal this is for Amtrak. Because as you can see, because of the innovation of the, north, of the, of the private sector on the Northeast Corridor with what we've done with our initiative, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, everything we've talked about, you can describe as innovation in service, in marketing, in technology or the organization, we've thought of how to run the Northeast Corridor in ways Amtrak has never considered before. But that's because we have to maximize profit. We have to maximize market share. We have to make it attractive to, for private investment. And that's how we've been able to figure these things out where Amtrak didn't. So we bring in what we do best and Amtrak can focus on what they do best with the ownership and stewardship of the, the public's interest in the infrastructure. And that's the relationship we'd like to do. And we're uh, going to be hopeful that the USDOT recognizes a great deal that we offer, particularly in this COVID-19 crisis and the issue to get the Amfleet out of service as fast as possible. And we suspect that the DOTs and the members of Congress on this route are gonna recognize this is nothing like they've ever seen before with trains going to Long Island and trains going via center city, Philadelphia. and non-stops they're going to say hey this is great let's let's support and encourage this private sector initiative that's what we're hopeful to see happen and I, I have to tell you that's very important because while we've identified the availability of the private sector investment of billions of dollars into the um, train sets uh, their commitment is dependent on 
a mutually beneficial agreement being uh, negotiated between Ameristar Rail and Amtrak for the operation and, and, and maintenance of, um, of our services on the quarter. And uh, I forgot to mention, in addition to user fees, <clears throat> on top of that, we're gonna be paying performance incentives to Amtrak, New Jersey Transit, Long Island Railroad, Metro North, to keep our trains on time. So they're gonna, this is all newfound money in terms of those revenues. Excellent. Thank you very much again. Uh, and thank you to everybody who asked questions. Um, I meant to say at the beginning, um, you know, we, we've been calling these brown bag lunches in order to keep them a little bit more casual. Um, and this, this year, this week's picture was a picture of a pizza that uh, I had a meeting in Rome with some folks who were talking about a high-speed line. I uh, have a real proposal for a high-speed line in the Midwest. Um, and I had seen a movie about why pizza is better in Naples. So the meeting uh, ended early. I was able to take the train down, grab the pizza and come back because of high-speed rail. It's about 140 miles, but they do it in an hour and 10 minutes. Wow. So it's basically Washington to Philadelphia in an hour and 10 minutes. Today's a cell is an hour and 45. Uh, we've got a couple of more events coming up. We just posted a bunch of new ones on our website um, at hsrail.org slash events. And um, uh, Feel free to call the office if you have any more questions or anything you'd like to discuss, anything about passenger trains. So, and, thank and you, Rick, Scott. I just want to mention uh, for anybody who does have questions that they didn't get to, uh, feel free to go to our website, ameristarrail.com, and use our contact page. And uh, we'd love to do our best to respond to you there. The questions are great because it helps us do what we have to do to uh, do this to the best of our ability. And I, and I love the pizza that you use to promote this. And I realized. Uh, one of the signs of our success is when we have these trains uh, running at high speeds for all, someone's going to invariably look for that pizza on our train. So I'm going to have to make sure that that's on the menu somehow. <laughs> you set you set the standard there, Rick. <laughs> and it was a really good pizza. It's a very high standard. <laughs> thank you. Yep. Thank you. I enjoyed the opportunity. Thanks very yeah. much.